It says, with garment down to the feet and guarded about the chest with a golden band. Now that describes the authority of Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ is coming as a commanding Christ. He is God of authority. He is coming as an authority. Amen. And that's why Isaiah 6 1 says, He says, Saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. So when Isaiah saw the Lord, he was dressed in that long flowing robe of judicial authority. So, number one, we know that Jesus Christ is going to come what? As an authority. Amen? Amen. And the second thing that we're going to uh, this about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Can we put that up for me, please? Now, number two, he is going to come as what? As the consecrated Christ. Amen? So, that's how Jesus is going to come in his second coming. As the consecrated Christ. And, and, and chapter, verse 14 of chapter 1 tells us that, you know, this is... He's coming, his head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow. And what does that describe? That describes the purity of Jesus Christ. Amen? So when he's coming, and that's why in the book of Isaiah 1, 1, he says, Come and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are like red crimson, they shall be as wool. So again, sin stains us. Sin leaves a spot on us. It blemishes us. It spots us. But the blood of Jesus Christ can make us clean. It can make us pure. Whitened snow as split wool. Amen? And this refers to the purity, to the cleanness, and to holiness. So there are three things there. Not just his purity, but his cleanliness and his holiness as well. Amen? And the third thing that Jesus Christ is going to come as is it's going to come as a comprehending Christ. What does that mean? It's talking about the discernment of Jesus Christ. Amen? Because the Bible says that his eyes are like a flaming fire. What that means is that nothing is hidden from Jesus Christ. He will see everything. And that's why Luke 8, 17 says, Nothing is secret that will not be revealed. Not anything hidden that will not be known and come to light. So whatever we are doing, we think we are doing it in secret. No, Jesus is all. Because he's coming as, you know, and the, and the scripture says this, as sagati, okay? But he's coming, in, in, you know, as, as one who is in command. He's a comprehending Christ. He's coming with a discernment, understanding, seeing everything. And Hebrews 4, 13 says, there's no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him, to come to whom we must give account. He is the all-wise, all-knowing, sagacious Christ. He knows it all. So Christ is coming, you know, like his eyes, like a fiery flame. He will see everything. Amen? And the fourth point we covered the last time, we said that he's coming what, as a condemning Christ. Because in verse 15, the Bible tells us that his feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace. And again, what that tells us is the severity of Jesus Christ. Amen? So now this time, Jesus is not coming as a baby in the lamb, okay? As a baby in the manger. He is coming according to the book of Genesis 3.15. It says that, where God said to the devil, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise the heel. So 2,000 years ago, you know, that's been found, fastened onto those feet. But one day, like a red hot iron, they'll be trampled upon. And the serpent said, and crush him with those powerful feet of brass. Amen? Praise God. So I just want to remind you that Jesus is not only coming as the, he is not coming as the lamb this time, but he's coming to judge us this time. Amen? He's coming as a judge. He's coming as a, you know, he, he, as a judge to judge us. He is the condemning Christ. He's not coming this time to, 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 to babysit us, but this time he's going to be the judge. So today I'm going to start on, on, um, on, on, on the, the second part of our you know, series. Amen? And today let's look at um, you know, the, 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 the sixth, you know, 
way that Jesus is going to come. Because we say that he's going to come as what? He's going to come as, um, you know, uh, commanding, you know, Christ. He's going to come as a comprehending Christ. And he's going to come as what? We say he's going to come as, um, you know, a, a consecrated Christ. But he's also going to come as a controlling Christ. Because in verse 16, verse 16 tells us that he had his right hand on seven stars. Okay. And this again refers to the sovereignty of Jesus Christ. You know, the little children, not just little children, but there's a song we sing that he holds the whole world in his hands. Do you remember that song? Yes, sir. But I tell you that he holds the whole universe in his hands. By him, things consist. And by him, all things are together. The very stars of their tracks, the very planets in their orbits are all held and guided by the sovereign hand of Jesus Christ. But here, now let's look at a greater symbolic meaning of what that means here. Let's, let's look at verse 20. Verse 20 says that these stars are the angels of the seven churches. Now, I believe that the angels of the seven churches represent the pastors of the seven churches. And also, this, the lampstands also represent the churches themselves. Okay? So, what am I saying? I'm saying that Jesus Christ holds in his very hand at this very moment the church, the people, the ministers, the servants and his pastors in his sovereign hand. And we need to remember that. You see, if this is not my church, okay, because we all say, oh, Pastor Mana Mazan is Pastor Mana's church. No, it is not my church. And you may not want to hear this, but it's not your church either. It is not our church. This church belongs to Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. This church is his church. Amen. And, but but don't, don't you worry a moment about God's church. Because, you know, we, we, we have had news, you know, fake news. And we have had these soothsayers who are going around saying, predicting the demise of the church and Christianity. But I just want to tell you, you know, Mount Zion this morning. Because the Bible says that even the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church of the living God. Amen. He said he cannot prevail against the church of the living God. He has complete control over celestial forces. He has complete control over spiritual forces. He has complete control over political forces. He has complete control over financial forces. Amen? Not one thing is overlooked, but all things are overruled by God. Amen? By the sovereign hand of Jesus Christ. Which I believe is the eight wonders of the modern world is the church of the living God. Amen? The church of God has survived persecution from without and problems from within the church. Sometimes it is infected by heresy, false teachers. At other times it is neglected by the members, we the members of ourselves. And other times it is infected by our sin. That we come to church. There are people teaching, preaching, singing in praise and worship. But they are sinning. But it is still the church remains to be the church of the living God. Amen? Amen. Held by his protective hand. Yes, the church may stumble, but will never fall. Even if it falls, it will rise again. Hallelujah. Amen? So he is the controlling Christ. He is the conquering Christ. We read in, in, in chapter 16, in verse 16 of chapter 1, it says that out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And now this is referring to the ferocity of Christ. Okay? Because the sword in scripture, what, what does that symbolize? It symbolizes death and war. Amen? So one of these days, the Lord Jesus Christ is coming to do battle against nations. And you have only one weapon to do that battle with. The sword that will proceed out of his mouth. That will be the weapon that he is going to use to fight nations. That in itself is a clue as to what the sword represents. Because if we go to the book of Hebrews 12, you know, uh, verse 4, the Bible reminds us, it says that the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So what are we saying? That God's word is a weapon that will either convict you to be saved or cut you if you refuse to be saved. But either way, it's 
going to cut you. Either it will bless you, cut it to be blessed, or cut it to bleed. Amen? So Jesus is coming back to do battle. He's coming back to fight a battle that will end all wars. A sword is for fighting. And Jesus tells us in Revelation 2.16, He said, I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. So the Lord Jesus is coming back to wage war. He's coming back to lay down, he's not coming back to lay down his sword because Jesus Christ is not a loser. He's coming to take vengeance on every tribe and every nation that has rejected him. Let's look at the purpose of this sword for a minute. Because Revelation 19.15 says, and out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike nations. So the only weapon that Jesus has is the word of God. Because that is the only weapon he needs. And we're told in Ephesians 6, chapter 6, he talks about us putting on the whole armor of God. But the only weapon we are given was the sword of the Spirit which is the word of God, because that's the only weapon that we need as believers. You see, nothing can stand before the word of God. When God spoke in the beginning and said, let there be light, darkness had to flee. When Jesus said, be healed, disease had to flee. When Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth, death had to flee. When Jesus says, Satan, get here behind me, the devil had to flee. The one thing in the world and the devil have been fighting against trying to destroy for many years is the word of God. But children of God, I come to say that when that last battle is fought and when that smoke is cleared, the one thing that will remain standing over all her enemies is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Amen? Amen. And verse 16 also tells us, it says this countenance was like the sun shining in his strength. So what does that mean? That refers to the majesty of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. It speaks of the, the Shekinah glory of Jesus Christ, of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And the Apostle Paul actually had to witness that, that bright light that blinded him 2,000 years ago. He experienced firsthand that radiant and glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. But you see that his countenance was like the sun. And the scripture says, shining in its strength. Now what does that mean? And I believe that it refers to the fact that the brightness of Jesus Christ can be compared to the brightness of the sun in its very beginning. And I say in its very beginning, that's the reason why. Because we, we, I don't know whether you realize that the sun today is not as powerful as it was in the days of Jesus Christ. It is not as powerful as it was in the days of Abraham. It is not as powerful as it was in the days of Adam. So now that simply means that as strong as the sun is today, it is not as strong as it was in the days of Jesus Christ. And I don't believe eyes are seen, or ears have heard, or minds can begin to even imagine the absolute radiance and glory is yet to be revealed from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Because when we look, when we talk in, in, the, in, the, in Revelation, towards the end of the book, he talks about the New Jerusalem. He says, in the New Jerusalem, there, there are not going to be sunshine. There's not going to be stars. So there's going to be no That brightness that we are going to experience in the New Jerusalem is what is radiating from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That bright light. That is what we're going to experience. So we will we'll just walk in the light of the glory of the Son of the living God. And that's how the new Jerusalem is going to be. We'll be walking in that radiance of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Praise God. Now the last point refers to the serenity of Christ. When John the Beloved, you know, um, disciples saw Jesus, that was in verse 17. This is what he said. He said that he fell at his feet as dead. All right? But when John saw him in all his radiance, all right, and all his glory, the Bible says that he fell 
at his feet as dead. Amen? So, so what the world needs today, Mount Zion Fellowship Church, what the world needs today, what the church needs today, what God's people need today is a new and real vision of Jesus Christ. That is what we need today. And we all see the challenges that we are having, you know, globally. Even world leaders cannot come up with a solution. The brightest minds in science and technology and medicine can find no cure to this virus. But God is in control. He has the answer. I'm afraid even amongst some God, you know, people, there is too much familiarity and not enough reverence for this man called Jesus. We refer to men as reverend, but we refer to Jesus Christ. Why Jesus? Because today that name has become a byword. It is a common name, it's a swear word. Another, you know, slang expression, Jesus. But I've come to tell you, loud and clear, that if you want to understand Jesus Christ, and if you want to be rightly related to him, you need to remember that Jesus Christ is not just Jesus Christ. Jesus is not even just Jesus the Christ. He is the Lord Jesus Christ before whom every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I tell you, there is no one like Jesus Christ. There has never been and there will never be anyone like Jesus. But this precious Lord Jesus Christ laid his right hand on Jesus in the scripture that I just read. A gesture of comfort, of assurance, and say, do not be afraid. And now the reason why John had no reason to be afraid, and children of God, no we, we don't have any reason to be afraid, is because Jesus holds the key of Hades and death. He holds the key, so we do not have to be afraid. And what does that key symbolize? Key symbolizes power and authority. Now Jesus was saying, in John, he says, I hold authority over death and hell itself. Therefore, John, no matter what you see in the vision to come, no matter what's going on around you, do not have, you do not have to be afraid. Amen? You know, children of God, I'm coming to a close. I, I can just imagine. 2,000 years ago, when a monster by the name of death reached out his skeleton finger and beckoned to God's dear son, he said, come, come, come to me. And Jesus walked towards him unflinching. He said, bound him with chain and caused him and threw him to the clammy tomb, thinking that he had defeated Jesus Christ and man's only hope. That sits on his bony throne, smiling, rejoicing, scorning across at a distance. One day passes, two day passes, three day passes, and the earth begins to quake and quiver. And the throne of this bony, scary devil collapses like a house of cards. The stone rolled away. And I was the Lord Jesus Christ. First the devil, and the devil's face was as white as snow with horror. Jesus walks up to this skeleton cover. He takes his hand that was nailed to the cross and held death by the neck. And took the other hand that was nailed, pierced to the cross and hauled him onto the floor in the empty tomb. Oh my gosh. And what did he do? He pulled this thing out of death. That's what Jesus did. He took this thing out of death. And then he placed his foot that was nailed pierced and put on the neck of the devil. And he said, you harmless stink. And Jesus turned around and looked at the stone that's been rolled away and gave the biggest shout ever that even heaven and hell can hear him. And he says, Oh, death, where is your stink? Oh, grave, we 
there is your victory. He then takes the key of death and hands and puts them on his side and he throws away in victory. Amen. And Revelation 20, 14 tells us that one of these days Jesus is going to come back and he's going to take death and hands. He's going to throw them into a pit, a bottomless pit. He's going to shut the door. He's going to knock it and throw away the key. But now and forevermore, friends, Jesus holds the key. He holds the key to salvation. He holds the key to satisfaction. He holds the key to eternal life. But Jesus just doesn't hold the key. He is the door as well. And if you will take that key and walk through that door, you can reign with him forever and ever and ever. Jesus is Lord. He is risen. Let us pray. Our loving and gracious Father, we thank you for the word of God. Father, I pray, O oh God, that in such a time like this, that we as believers will begin to revive Jesus Christ. Not just mention the name casually, but that he is the Lord Jesus. As the Bible says at the mention of that name, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. Confessing what? Declaring him as the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, when we come to that realization that Jesus Christ is our Lord, our Savior, and our Master. Father, I thank you, O oh God, Jehovah, for your revelation. I thank you for what you are revealing to us, O oh God, especially in times like this. And I pray, O oh God, that we'll come to that understanding of who our Lord and Savior Jesus is. That we'll have no fear no matter what. No matter what oh God has been pronounced around us. That we'll have faith and confidence in you. That we'll anchor our faith in you, Lord, because you are still in control. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. And amen.